upcoming readings for those who might be local here in Tucson. And those of you who aren't, we do put everything up. We do record all of our readings and we have a YouTube page and a SoundCloud page so you can go and check out the archive. It's fantastic. Uh, on February 18th, in-person reading will be Lytle Shaw and Raquel Gutierrez. I'm not sure what time that is or when that's gonna be or where it's gonna be. Um, March 18th, we're gonna have Hank Laser, and he'll be reading with our own Tenny Nathanson and Charles Alexander. And that will also be in person at the Steinfeld Warehouse in Tucson, 7 p.m., March 18th. And again, you can go to our website and see all of the events as they come. Uh, at the conclusion of the reading, we'd like to invite everybody just to stay. We usually have a little bit of a Q&A and discussion, if that's okay with our poets today. And it'll be on the same Zoom link, assuming it holds, right? And finally, just a couple of quick acknowledgements. Uh, POG intends to be an inclusive, supportive, and most importantly, a safe space for everyone. If anyone should feel otherwise, please do reach out to one of our directors, including me. Maybe you can all raise hands, those of you who are directors. Okay. And secondly, POG would also like to acknowledge the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we call home. Tucson, where POG is based, is the ancestral home of the Tohono, the Tohono, I'm sorry, the Tohono O'odham and Pasquayaki nations, we'd ask that we please take a moment to reflect on how, in the wake of a history of violence and dispossession, we can move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Okay, thank you for that. So I'm going to turn the podium over now to our attendee Nathanson, who will say some words about Trace. And again, Stephen, thank you for being here. Thanks, Stephen, and thanks for everybody for for coming out to hear the poetry and for putting up with the Zoom foibles, which we don't usually have. But there we go. All right. So okay then, I'm sure I speak for many other Pogsters and Tucson poets as well when I say it's a special delight to welcome Trace Peterson back to read again for Pog tonight. Wish it wasn't just virtual, but so be it for now. When Trace earned her MFA here some years ago, she was a mainstay of the POG and wider Tucson poetry communities, a bond which in her rare case has only strengthened and deepened for us in the ensuing years, which have been filled with many shared enthusiasms and Tucson inflected projects. But I hereby shut the lid on old home week. Department of Other Hat. Trace is a brilliant and groundbreaking scholar, at once canny theorist, chronicler of key histories, memoirist, you are there with Trace Peterson as, and preternaturally astute close reader, whose dissertation at the CUNY Graduate Center on the origins and early years of trans poetry and other trans writing is going to be a field-defining book. Turns out, no surprise, the other hat isn't quite other. The enthusiasms and brilliance of her scholarship also tra shape Trace's witty and moving poetry. By turns, and they are quick turns, acerbic, bemused, affronted, seductive, courageous, and tender, the poems move with a shape-shifting surprise and not quite losing our balance here, poise, that feels both quintessentially trans and altogether characteristic of much of the best recent avant writing. CF, everyone is a little trans. Here's one salient characteristic local maneuver. Let's make a list. Whitman, stout as a horse, affectionate, haughty, electrical, I in this mystery, here we stand. Affectionate, haughty, electrical? O'Hara, be always high, full of honor and regard and lanolin. Lanolin? Peterson, from her by now iconic and recently targeted poem, everyone is a little trans, everyone is a little bisexual, everyone is a little gender queer, everyone is a little not there, everyone is a little envy, everyone is a little gender fluid, everyone is a little 12 inch pianist. What? Would you please keep your parameters clear and consistent, please? Nope, thank you very much. In Trace's poetry, what happens here with language games glimpsed going over the wall or running amok turns out also to be true of bodies, both literal and phantasmatic. Another link between what I hope I'm rightly calling quintessential trans writing and quintessential avant in lots of its many other incarnations. 
So here come the not two hats again, or bodies, a space of not other and not not other, not one and not two, as the Zenis say. As Trace wrote once of somebody else's poetry, her own writing engenders a bendy body space, gender fluid and self and other fluid too, self and other fluid too, and also self and world fluid in a way that augurs transformation we might, a bit abashed, want to call utopian. I think that's where some of the quicksilver changes of tone, diction, and syntax come from. The poetry's tendency to slip, for instance, from irascibility to tenderness or awe in a heartbeat. Trace's poetry is hip and contemporary and thoroughly averse to the grandiose, but there's an expansive and visionary sensibility lurking somewhere in the neighborhood, though you have to look fast or hear fast to hear it. Curator and community builder par, extra, par excellence, superb scholar, Trace is also the acclaimed author of the twice published, once pre-transition, once post, since I moved in, from Tucson's own redoubtable Chax Press. She'll read tonight from her completed book manuscript, The Valleys Are So Lush and Steep. Insofar as it's possible on Zoom, please join me in giving a really big welcome to Trace Peterson. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tony. That that was just um, meant the world to me. That was a beautiful introduction. Um, okay, I'm I'm really excited to be here with you all, uh, and uh, let's give this a try. Oh, hang on one second. <laughs> I had some extra background noise, and now it's gone. So I'm going to read some poems from my. Uh, new manuscript, as, as Tenny mentioned. Um, uh, well, first of all, I want to say um, it's an honor to be here reading for Pog. And um, Pog for me has always represented something uh, in literature and in poetry that um, uh, it feels like home to me. It's uh, where I learned how to be a poet and where I have persistently um, kept trying to make other places <laughs> into Pog and Tucson. Uh, uh, there's something about the kind of community that uh, Tenny and Charles and, uh, and now Steve and uh, everyone who, who works with Pog and Chax have, have been able to um, engender in Tucson or generate in Tucson. And um, it's really made a difference in my life. And it's made a lot of things possible for me, including a continuing love for poetry. Um, because of the, the, I don't know what if I want to say set of values, but um, the sort of vibe, uh, as my students are fond of saying, that um, uh, is is present uh, among uh, the Pog folks, and I'm really grateful for you all, and it's an honor to be reading um, for for the series tonight. Okay, now poems. Uh, so I'm going to start. I'm going to read three poems tonight. Um, and the first one is called Pussy. <clears throat> Pussy. My butt, my back, my stomach, my breasts, my shoulders, my arms leaning on the table, my uncanny valley, my desk job aversion, my porcupine quills, my stoppages, my filler, my quicksand, my elevated archness, my foolproof schemes, my childlessness, my shipping costs, my frozen hopper characters huddled in a diner, my ballistics estimates coming in under budget, my hair falling all around my face, my blind spot, my blonde spit, my softness, my blocked doorway, my insufficient no, my unfuckability, my team, my timing, my authorial deferment, my duplicate checks, my straining to see the others, my U-Haul following behind my gate, my educating, my fogging up the window looking in on my schooling, my pushing back adjacent to my facts. Okay, now the second poem I want to read 
today is called um, Violet Speech. And this is a longer piece. Um, uh, it was originally published as a chapbook, um, but it's a longer piece and it's, it's really a piece about transition. It's really a piece about social consequences and social dimensions surrounding transition, gender transition. Um, but it's also about um, the present and the situation we find ourselves in um, regarding, I, I looked at it again and I can see how utterly current it feels. Um, uh, it was written ab about 10 years ago, uh, as I, uh, I would say 13 years ago, as I was in the process of um, trying to transition socially in poetry. And um, it has a significant kind of, uh, we should say ambiently MAGA strain in the background that it interests me that seems to persist um, in the, the theme of queerness being appropriated uh, in various ways or queer rhetorics being appropriated in various ways by, by folks who are not sympathetic to, to our lives and us. Um, and I'm gonna end with a coda, which is a separate poem that I wrote after I transitioned. And it sort of puts the poem in a different perspective. So this is Violet's speech. And this is, this is a longer poem, so this is going to take probably about 20 minutes. Um, okay. <clears throat> Violet speech. The violets in the mixed perennial border plump with lacy edges come in a variety of purples. The violets providing orally answered, please rise, please stand. The undertenant of said premises, stem to petiole to leaf, voiced several stipulations drooping after rain, sweet crowlow vortex stain. A cross-examination. How do you answer the stigma-style petal ovary? I speak an unlisted option, stigma anther. An argument ensues, and I'm insisting, now shouting at the clerk behind the desk, like a buzzing bee, he gathers drones, hard-ons. I am his receptacle, discretion. Perennial violets spread by creeping roots and rhizomes, duly sworn before a plaque that reads, In God We Trust. The entire garden bed, a court. A caption for that plaque we saw behind the violet's head, low-slung ceilings miracle grow. Cheap name tag font cotyledons. Take notice, the court has decided. Violet speech is harmful. Violet speech cannot be legislated. The violet we'd want eluded its propositioner's desires. This field too dark fuchsia, this malevolent light purple body too foregoing to surrender up sun rays. Armies recline on armoires, illuminated by the occasional flash of violet color. Gray, resentful faces walk among violets marred by an amendment by the claimant. Words hammered at the dais around which violets gathered, clamoring for restrictions on our need to legislate the fact that we were violets were conscious of what was said about us, how we avoided becoming a plot that could be quantified, surrounded, dug up. Stigma, style, petal, ovary, how we approach the bench, bed, violets caption hammered, armies, font cotyledons flash, please rise. We avoided, marred, gathers drones, self-pollinated, donning a knot, a meadow discontinuance open, need those threatened, bracteoles, donning a swarming. The dirt is swarming with small flowered hybrid lawyers. A violet donning a suit, suit donning a violet. I pray for a meadow discontinuance up close. Instead, I get an untitled judgment, a dismissal without prejudice, like the painter Rothko. A line composed of complementary colors divides the bracteoles of the canvas in the proportions of a figure with vibrating edges. A human figure, not a violet, self-pollinated and pointing downward, thinks thickets. The entire garden bed a court, the family ranging from nut-like seeds spread by ants stalking the sheets, but violets are not as powerful as passive resistance. Outside, I breathe in the purple air. My violet suit, a woman observes my violet suit, stops me and asks if I'm here for the beer tasting meetup. 
After blooming, we visit the Metropolitan Museum and pay the minimum endosperm fee. After blooming, we produce capsules that when they open, grow into poems. Rothko, dismissal, ranging, passive, violet day, publicly blooming, breathe in the endosperm. Receptacle asks when they open, grow, among instead, sponsor, higher power, I pray red square backing, modeling, Rothko boxes, dead heads, liminal early lagging, fade listening, dilapidated amendment, array. But back to what I was saying about Rothko's paintings. Rothko sits through the entire self-help session listening to everyone talk. Then when he opens his mouth about four people, all violets, get up and leave. Rothko is extremely upset, purple, blue, yellow, and so am I. It makes him feel his paintings aren't worth listening to. They actually barely are, barely there. Confronted instead by the human form already segmented like a coffin, cut to abstract proportions of a dead head. Most painters lose their attraction as they fade, although some argue that dead heading can increase performance. I'd complain about this simplification to the dark red square taking up the bottom corner as if it could remember former blooms. If the boxes shtick gets old and the rules underlying them change like natural selection, would hurt adapt with the ability to be art? Rothko attempts to answer me here using terms like sponsor and higher power, but his liminal early canvases speak otherwise. I am lagging behind the group now, looking them over. Is Rothko a petitioner, a respondent, or a lawyer? Am I Rothko? Repetition isn't inevitable. The demon who suddenly appears to you in the poem and says, you are doomed to always write about violets. Instead, you can make an atmospheric scene of a subway like Rothko did with a dour glowing color combination that creates depth within a shallow space, reaching around like a body that belies available discourse. I notice something flash on the street outside, something violet. I try to take a photo out the window. Argue segmented Rothko, embodied life, dour phrase factory, coffin respondent of violet, spring impinges, self-help tragic, lagging poem belies you'd point, strategic layout, running water, canvases otherwise petitioner, barely a shallow. At this stage, total estimate for poem construction is 32,800 plus tax. Installation of the Rothko paintings may cost extra due to shipping related precautions. Importation of specific breeds of violets adds possible embodied energy with additional costs anticipated for continued maintenance as spring impinges on us, opening the poem like a bloom that only appears fictitious. In order to proceed, we need to have 30% of the allegory provided up front. We look forward to working with you and helping you take your poem to the next level loosening up that frame which could have doomed you to a tragic metaphor, Orpheus, Electra, Pandora, et al. Once the initial design phase has been completed, installation of poem on stainless steel or concrete requires an additional two months, but installation on wind and running water is negligible. Strategic alternation of metaphors of artistic genius and altruistic service allows us to speak through you actually providing impetus for the poems, but not, you'd argue, making the real design decisions. Have you been subordinated to the engineering process at this point? Your you being written like an accident? Are you a factory poet? As long as you contribute an appropriately large deposit up front, we won't need to answer that question. Sincerely, War of the World's Design Systems. Contribute to unhappiness up due to lack, shipping related, 14 blocks of tragic your you, lace topped challenge, accident, we need continued Rothko terminals made of saliva, black fibers, working for antennae to proceed, open plan spring a nest, appears rearing prefer, hunched dreamily. 
It's a challenge working for the wasps, hunched secretly among them at endless computer terminals made of paper fibers collected from dry wood bark and saliva, googling away. Or do they work for me in my shifting boundaries? The wasps rely on a nest from which we conduct many activities, rearing young, installing 14 blocks of new housing, accentuating the open plan layout of very low lace topped necks. When they order me to get on top of things in WASP language, communicated by saliva collusion antennae collision, I need to remind myself these males lack a stinger. A reluctant WASP, I prefer instead to stare out the L-shaped sky patios dreamily on a softly padded, observe orientation, take advantage of the sun, how they stage thrills and overlapping of program and landscape elements, various periods of extreme tight lacing. I accumulate this and other strings of words for the wasps as a means of translating their desires. Maybe they won't notice the violet streaks. Cutting our teeth on competition wins, highly varied commissions and the life juices of potent younger firms. We typically build our umbrella shaped nests under eaves and ledges but wasp waist laces stick tightly drawn in a bait. Distrust my fag brain description of the hives we slenderly experience buttoned up to promote biodiversity. Altruistic service, a saliva, slenderly fag brain competition, other insect hardened by whole, landscape patron, mor morally smug, wing cutaway sort of day, I could remove private roofs, cyberspace tendons, fuck face, punctured in a lower loss, breathed openly integrated, slenderly than mere away. Take notice. If you fail to answer or appear, the wasps won't reveal the secrets of our real parasitic or predacious activities which play a vital role in limiting the populations of other insect species. Yet sometimes I see a few of them through a crack in the combs, laying their eggs inside a client or vendor. Take notice, when the client appears puffed up brown and hardened by typological research, the adult parasitic wasps chew a round hole in the abdomen to emerge. <clears throat> when I see this behavior, it still turns my stomach and I almost want to put down the caterpillar, the throat of which I'm currently sucking the juice from. The wasps, like Rothko, are nice modernists. Nice laying vital, play client, focused ornamenting a draft. <clears throat> Volatile turns, my brain, my spine, caterpillar team, green rug. Portico's chagrin appears client almost want the wasp pathos, design team hardened, adult still, zooming back to reveal. Identity is so messy, like an essay. Can this escape from legislation be legislated? I'm starting to distrust myself as a client, I thought, so I'll get on top of things. I'll try to see how many components I can remove, uncover the essence. First, the wasp waste goes into the dumpster, then the wasp pathos, then the contours of my face, rudimentary projecting cornice, my left arm at the spot where it enters the torso, see longitudinal section, is detached for recycling and reuse in someone's trust timber roof. I'm almost bare, a morally smug green rug, almost there. But when I discover I've thrown half my brain into cyberspace, I stage a protest against my design team pensive violets ornamenting my loss. In effect, I'm dead heading my own chagrin. The arch of my spine, already punctuated in a lower quadrant, falls into the next stanza on a grand scale, see cutaway elevation. A monster I breathe openly, without lungs, more integrated into the landscape than ever before, allowing for a sense of community that includes, oops, I lost part of the page in the printout, hang on allowing for a sense of community that includes space for private reflection. Like an open plan office pitched to the unsuspecting wasp, I predict production porticos. Yet in private moments of which there are now none, I keep zooming back 
focus back to the bed of violets, pouring over their legal briefs in long, slow drafts that provoke the essence of volatile lived norms. For example, some violets have a special shaped flower petal that resembles a wasp wing, but to draw this comparison would be like installing plants as one of your parents. The leaves, it's true, looked like a bustle from an old fashioned dress. Equipment monster openly, quadrant fell an Orpheus day. Application of stone to loss, chagrin my spine, old fashioned, without they them a smug see, try to look heart shaped, bustle beetle, punctured of reflection, my left. The petitioner prays for a final judgment of eviction, awarding to the petitioner possession of premises described as follows. Bed of violets, writing subject, wasp nest, Rothko. Political opinions, writer's body, vision, reader, fingernails, purse. Who is the petitioner? The middle manager? This cutaway section of the violet shows all the equipment you need to identify as kidney-shaped, heart-shaped, or actively growing. This anther, it's true, contains a pollen cross-section which allows internal drainage. The application of stone to the blossom rather than mere cladding creates an Orpheus sort of day in which remembered surface constitutes functionality. Well, okay, so I'm stuck with a plaque that reads, In God We Trust, written in 10 ugly fonts on the back wall. It doesn't move me at all. Now approach the bench, a hunch, a group of wasps and the violets that try to look like them, or maybe they're violets and the wasps who try to be their them. Try to look. Who is writing this? Fuck. Suddenly a wasp, a violet, lands on the Rothko painting and tries to suck it dry. Okay, and now this is the coda that goes after, which is sort of part of the poem, and it's short. Coda. What used to be chivalrous is now unassertive. What used to be charmingly self-deprecating is now painfully self-negating. What used to be appreciated as supportive is now demanded and enforced at penalty of a heavy fine. What used to be tender is now insultingly condescending. What used to be considered a brilliant comment is now acceptable provided a nearby male approves it and agrees. What used to be a witty conversational riposte is now aggressive or even violet. What used to be shit doesn't stink. What used to be intimacy is now sitting in the waiting room, a nicely decorated waiting room with flowers, wasps, piped in smooth jazz and terrible magazines. What used to be terrifying is now harmless. What used to be what used to be is now another person's life. What used to be the complex development of a long heroic buildings roman is now the days of our lives meets hot in Cleveland meets alien. What used to be an idle theory or idea is now showing up as the proof of my discourse which changes what had been initially meant, that I am not in fact a discourse or a theory or an idea, but someone other than those things. What used to be consciousness is now the necessity to always remain alert. What used to be basic kindness is now flirting. What used to be rejection is now perky, failed rejection. What used to be poetry is now poetry. What used to be expertise or knowledge or experience is a swarm of ambient words he barely hears looking deep into your peerless eyes. What used to be humiliating is now strengthening, emboldening. What used to be human is now reframable. What used to be water is now steam. Wow. That was marvelous, Trace. My goodness, your your control over all your different images just dazzling. dazzling. Oh, 
Charles had asked if we could do a quick interlude uh, in honor of a very important birthday yesterday, which was Gertrude Stein, February 3rd, 1874, I believe, right? Very quickly, we'll hear from Charles, and then I'll turn it over to David Weiss, who will introduce Joy. Yes, we stand on uh, strong shoulders, foremothers, forefathers, predecessors, and, and we often note the geographical ones, but not always the poetic ones. So I just wanted to say, yes, that Gertrude Stein's birthday was yesterday, and in February 1940, in the pages of Poetry Magazine appeared um, parts of Stanzas in Meditation, one of her most important works. And I wanted to read the very last part of that, which was one of those that appeared there. And that is the um, very end of that great work, which reads, why am I, if I am uncertain, reasons may enclose? Remain, remain, propose, repose, chose, I call carelessly that the door is open, which is, uh, which if they may refuse to open, no one can rush to close. Let them be mine, therefore. Everybody knows that I chose. Therefore, if therefore, before I close, I will therefore offer, therefore I other this, which if I refuse to miss, maybe miss is mine. I will be well welcome when I come, because I am coming. Certainly I come, having come. These stanzas are done. And then to get on with it, I'll just notice that the, the very uh, stanza in meditation before this is one line only, which reads, thank you for hurrying through. So I'm hurrying through and please continue. Thank you, Charles. That was lovely. We should do that every reading. We should have a little. <laughs> okay. I'm going to turn it over now to David Weiss, our dear friend, and who will be introducing Joy. Hi. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, Joy Layden is a celebrated essayist, poet, scholar, and speaker, as well as a prominent figure in both the trans poetics and trans theology spheres. Her book, the Book of Anna, originally published in 2006 by Sheep Metal Press, with a second printing from AOWOG in 2021, was awarded the National Jewish Book Award in Poetry. The Soul of the Stranger, Reading God and Torah from a Transgender's Perspective, from, was published from Brandeis in 2018, was a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award. And her memoir, Through the Door of Life, uh, University of Wisconsin 2013 was a finalist for the, a National Jewish Book Award. These along with many other books, publications, scholarly articles, and awards. Joy held the David and Ruth Gottsman Chair in English at uh, Stern College for Women at Yeshiva University from 2003 to 2021. After a transition in 2008, Joy became the first openly transgender professor to teach at an Orthodox Jewish university. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. In Midrashic literature, it's said that Aleph is the humblest of letters. Because of this humility, Aleph remained silent and allowed Bet to begin the creation account. Joy ends the book of Anna with Aleph. In this way, the book of Anna ends with silence. But this is a pregnant silence a breath in proceeding, in the beginning, let there be, and there was. In her interview with Connecting Point on New England Public Media, Joy quotes Emerson's self-reliance. We pass for what we are. No identity can account for the breadth and complexity of being of a lived in human life. 
yet we also inhabit these distinctions as constructs held between us, each other, and the world. In this way, the preoccupations of identity bear a kinship to the preoccupations of language, something the Jewish tradition of Torah as the life engendering world encompassing textual practice has a particular depthness with. In the anthology Troubling the Line, as it edited by Trace Peterson and T.C. Tolbert from Nightboat in 2013, Joy ends her trans manifesto this way. If we are smart, honest, work hard and stay on our tones, uh, stay on our toes, Trans poetics will grow through us from yet another fashionably vague critical term into an understanding of language, form, and humanness as precise as a scalpel and as urgent as the silence of God. It is my pleasure to introduce Joy Layden. Thank you so much, David, and um, thank you, Pogue. Um, I feel like the evening has already been so overflowingly full. It's hard to imagine adding anything to it. And uh, Trace, thank you for that phenomenal reading. Um, Violet's speeches was a mind-blowing poem when I read it to myself. I never imagined hearing it out loud. And, you know, so that was something that should have been on my bucket list, and, and now I, I can put it on and cross it right off. But I got that. Thank you. I'm gonna start with a selection from the book of Anna. Um, uh, Anna is a fictional uh, character writing in 1950s Prague. She spent her adolescence in a concentration camp and all of the poems that she's writing, she's trying to sort of figure out a way to continue existing. Um, and this one picks up uh, her story at when the war is over um, and talks about some of her experiences after it. And it's called Gollum. Um, Anna wasn't written as, um, as a trans work, it was, but it was written in the closet. And it was uh, a way that I was working through issues of my own while Anna was working through her issues. So Anna reaches for the figure of the golem, as you'll see to her, it represents um, a state of barely created being, right? The golem is a subperson, um, but who is created? The golem is brought to life with the word truth, which in Hebrew has the word death inside it. Get rid of the golem by erasing the first letter and it turns the word truth into the word death. Um, for me, the Gollum idea worked really well um, as a figure for my dissociation from my own body and the sense that I really was also a not quite created person because I had never lived as who I was. Um, and, okay, so. Somebody. This one is addressed to Yasel. This is the name that she gave the Golem of Prague, which is the most famous um, Golem. The end of the world was over, Yasel, by the time I turned 19. Extermination had given way to the bureaucratic grief of clothing and housing thousands of corpses, coughing in the air of the future they weren't supposed to breathe. Displaced persons, Yasel. As it says in Psalm 115, they have hands, but feel not, noses, but smell not. They have nothing in their throats to say, shaven bones and barbed wire yards, neither truth nor death can animate their scars. I didn't know him from Adam. The GIs waved him in, a well-dressed burger, a humanitarian. Come, he tells me, he told them to locate relatives for rich Americans, Jews with guilt complexes, he laughs, the size of Volkswagens. Smile, he says, steering me past the sergeant who signed me over to him. To Jews, he says, I was always a friend. He strolled the yard, waving his unlit cigarette like a conductor's baton. I was the instrument he lighted on, a suitable mound, a mons. 
He recognized that in me. I didn't recognize him. I have certain needs, he says. Tongues my ear. You'll lack for nothing. Nothing answers him. Hinges of wood, splinters. I haven't spoken since the camps. Yasel, the rabbis say God alone gives speech to clay. Rava fashioned a golem exactly like a man. Yet when Rabbi Zera spoke, the golem couldn't answer. Unbutton your dress, slowly I said. Lick your lips, unzip my pants. The only question, Yasel, is whether to swallow or spit. He tells me that too, in the ineffable language of scent. Breathe, he says, and breathe I did. The smell of roses, white gold roses, as my clay swallowed his. Roses, Yasel, the Lord of life and death. That's what everyone called him, even his fellow SS, doused himself in eau de cologne before he took his women, the sweetest scent in the camps. Then to see his face meant a trip to the gas. Three times I choked in that cloud. When I was 12, my mother said, roses smell like lost lovers. And I breathed deeper, sickening with desire. His scent, Yasso, his hands, younger somehow, softer, almost innocent, yank me to an upright position. Fine black hair is a twitch like insect legs, no moles or identifying scars. I raise my eyes, see his face and live. I straighten, spit. He laughs, grabs an earlobe, slaps. His titter twitters towards soprano. A woman without a man is a golem. So the rabbis said, of course, Yasel, a man is what I have. I have things to do, he says. One hour, I'll be back. I weigh approximately 86 pounds. My bone is not hidden from him. The Lord of life and death strides into the salle de bain with barely a glance at the matter on the bed. Shaves, splashes white gold rose on wrists and fingertips. No doubt, Yasso, about his humanness. He talks nonstop to his reflection, reflecting for my edification on sodomy's etiquette. Splinters answer him. The chair leg that took me 20 minutes to detach cracks the back of his head. I could have left. He hadn't locked me in. But Prague was filled with corpses, Yasso. I had decided to live. In the next uh, section, I think Anna says something like um, murderous therapeutic. And she wishes she could do it every night, and then she'd be able to sleep. But. Um, not a role model, kind of a hero, not really a role model. Um, I'm incredibly, eternally grateful to Trace for uh, republishing Anna, and which had um, barely been published the first time and um, had disappeared completely right away. Um, the book that came out last year uh, was called Shekhina Speaks. It's oddly related to Anna because I, I was longing to write something that had some of that um, ruthless energy that Anna has. Um, Shekhina Speaks is um, a poetic attempt to, for the, uh, to create space for the Shekhina, which in Jewish tradition is the, the female imminent aspect of God to speak through human language. And in Jewish tradition, the Shekhina doesn't say anything. You know, she's the female aspect of God. So naturally she doesn't get to talk. Um, but I really wanted to know what she would say. Um, and I selected just a couple of poems that to me intersect. And again, she's not um, a trans figure exactly, but she was created using trans poetics in the sense that trans poetics for me is just 
poetic techniques that we use to represent ways of being human or being a, be a person, a conscious being for which language doesn't have any built-in resources. There are no conventions that help us represent it. So the Shekhinah is divine. So their human language really is not adequate for her. So trans poetics was necessary for me. Um, and because I was reading with Trace, I started looking to see if there was any more, you know, any actual intersection for me with my trans experience in her that was not intentional. And a couple of poems I think you will see, maybe there is. This is called Real True Ghost Story. Um, all the poems are made out of words found in two different kinds of texts. One is a chapter of Isaiah, and the other is a cosmopolitan article that resonates with it. So the Isaiah chapter includes the lines, I've put my words in your mouth and covered you with the shadow of my hand. And the Cosmo article is, 10 terrifying real ghost stories to tell at your next girl's night. Something is there, you think. Something that holds you from birth to death, like an antelope caught in a net, as heavens go up in smoke and worlds wear out like garments. Something that staggers you, dries up your waters, drains you to the dregs by whispering, you aren't paralyzed, but you can't get away, can't apologize, can't hide, can't pretend the way you did when you were a kid, that you've already died. Something is there that never sleeps, something that can't be crushed or killed, shoves its words into your mouth, forcing doors you try to close by whispering, I am. You wonder if any of this actually happens, but you never wonder why you feel so sick when I am ma masses in your mouth, in your bed, in the unexplained noise of forever moving furniture in your head. On the other side of whatever you are, there's nothing but I am, a whisper that stumbles out of the kitchen and crawls across your skin. Time, a bowl, a drink of water, a nightmare trying to wake you up by singing in your ear. So for the Shekhinah, I am is, I mean, this is like pretty much all God says that human beings can apprehend, just I am. But there's something about my experience of the necessity of, and the terrifying necessity of being who I was um, that led me to transition that also feels like the I am nightmare trying to wake me up by singing in my ear kind of thing. Um, so this is another Shekhina speaking poem. And I should have said before, she speaks in every poem to a human you that is meant to be each of us individually. Um, this is called Your Body. Um, you keep trying to escape the body I love, the blazing crush of physicality impurity and shame, separating you from yourself, from your soul, from me. The body I formed in your mother's womb, delivered, dandled, nursed and comforted. The body that fails you in so many ways, through which you struggle to materialize, the way tomorrow struggles to materialize through today. Blessing through pain, love through the flesh I made, to be a place where you and I can rest, hang out, go crazy for one another, marry, say goodbye, apologize, consume and burn like incense, can plead, pledge, proclaim, be held and protected, given and accepted, born and born again. It's me you feel moving inside you, my presence that's so hard to reconcile with your sexual nature and the nature of sex, that sometimes you feel violated, devoured, tell yourself that you're no good. Imagine me demanding you preach gospels of fire, gospels of bone, gospels of coming to an end. I didn't make you to end. I made you a whirlwind of appetites and offerings I never stopped wanting. Ceremony and sacrifice, 
wine and reckoning, comedy, coolness, birthing and healing, falling in love, romance, yes, and sex. Your body is a stream from which I drink, a hand I hold, a nipple I lick, a story I tell over and over, a Sabbath I keep for pleasure, a way of being alone, a way of being together. My choir, my throne, my crazy music, my dog-eared paperback. And I just have to say, the Shekhina seems to like my body a heck of a lot more than I do. Um, but I, I do think it was, um, it was something incredibly healing hearing that voice come together out of those words um, that I was mixing. Um, I want to finish with uh, two poems um, from uh, books that are going to come out. Um, the first is another republication. Um, Sheep Meadow Press, my first press, let all my books go out of print. Trace Resurrected, the Book of Anna, and um, now Double Back Books is going to do a new edition of Impersonation, which includes a sequence of uh, poems called Transitive Venus that actually is, was about gender transition. Um, it was partly an effort to find language for what I was going through, but also partly an effort to tune into a voice telling me to keep persisting and with this difficult process of becoming. And this is the sixth poem called A Trip to the Ladies Room. Now it's time to choose between the future you see growing in the mirror and the family that made you bigger than yourself, begging you to stay the man you pretended to be. But that woman, the one in the mirror, she's your family too. That's why you're ashamed. She looks so much like you. Think about it. The brain is the biggest ladies room. Every woman you're not supposed to be is lined up there to toast the birthday girl. The sun queen shining graciously, the gammon giggling into her phone, the middle-aged matron with hazel eyes picking strawberries at dawn. Anyone can blend a familiar face with new clothes, new roles, a new silhouette, but it takes time to decide which you you're growing into. Hit a few curveballs, step on a few toes, paint your tips of pink too risky even to think about in public. You have nothing to point your way, but long forbidden cravings, not for you know what. For a self others can see and touch, and a heart that leaps like salmon in a body that feels like yours, a body that loves and falls in love and answers someone's prayers. Um, so, thank you. Y'all probably think now that I do nothing but republish old books, which, you know, that's most of what I do, but you know, I do write some new stuff too. Um, uh, so I have a new book coming out from Priscilla uh, called Family. And uh, it includes a poem that was commissioned by of all things, the New York Philharmonic Orchestra um, for the hundredth anniversary of the passage of the 19th amendment. Um, so a whole bunch of poets wrote poems. There was gonna be a big event where we read those poems. Uh, and that event was supposed to take place a few weeks after the pandemic started. So yeah, that didn't happen. Um, but my poem was called A Bridge on Account of Sex. A 21st century trans woman speaks to Susan B. Anthony. Uh, and this is the second session, uh, section. Um, and my mother died last year. And um, as you'll see this, has kind of a tribute to her in it. So I wanted to read it. In Rochester, New York, in the America you insisted had no right not to exist, slavery abolished, voting rights unabridgeable, at least on paper, on account of race and sex. I was born to a card-carrying member of your 20th century daughters, 
the League of Women Voters. My mother, who thought I was her son, taught me nothing about being a woman, but she taught me to vote and drive a stick, stick up for myself in supermarkets, speak in a low voice. She trained for radio, and she showed me how to live without being ashamed of being curly, freckled, Jewish, mouthy, different. A magazine on her nightstand taught me the word for what I am, though it was 40 years before she heard me say it, a word you never learned because it didn't exist for a way of being human you couldn't imagine. I guess I'm not a truth you'd hold self-evident. I wonder if you'd say I, like you, was created equal, was created at all, in fact, or would write me off as yet another outrage perpetrated by men, or would see me refusing, like you, to be what others said, and tell me, as my mother did, whatever you look like, you'll always be my child. No, you wouldn't say that. You didn't have people like me in mind when you fought your country to redefine what it means to be a woman. But here we are, and here I am, abridged like you on account of sex, wrapped like you in education, money, and whiteness that have so far kept me from being jailed, evicted, beaten, burned, or tossed in a ditch as my sisters have for defying like you contrary to the statute and against the peace of the United States of America, every decree and argument that we are created less, created to hide, created to cringe, created to accept that we're excluded by definition from the unabridgeable we, by whom, for whom you insisted, America was created. We, like you, refuse to be determined by the bodies we were born in, to accept assumptions and abide by laws that deem us other and less than who we know we are. America needed you to refuse. Asking as your daughter's daughter, does America need me too? Thank you. Oh, thank you, Joy, that was marvelous. My goodness, this is one of the most beautiful readings I think we've had in, you know, Maybe since the last one, I don't know. They're all beautiful. Are you, you going to read more? I, I, I wasn't. I was trying to. I was you hoping know. you might read one, one or two more. OK, did you have any requests? Mm -hmm. Or you want me to just? My goodness. Um, hmm. I can do another Shekhinah poem or two. Yes, please. Yeah, I want to hear more Shahina. Yeah. Yeah, I was All hoping right. some of that. Yeah. All right. Well, first I want to read the epigraph for the book, which is from the Zohar. Um it says she's sometimes called daughter and sometimes sister and sometimes mother. She is all and everything is in her. Um All right, this is one I cut out in the interest of time, but this is making me read more, so what can I do? <laughs> this is called Melting Away. The um, epigraph from Isaiah is, you say to yourself, I am, and there is no one besides me. And the Cosmo article is, the scary, scary way your friends are losing weight. Melting Away. I sit in the stubble of your heart, listening to you say, I am. I am, you say, and there is no one besides me, by which you mean no one to remember, no one to love, your wise and childish, tender, obsessive, intermittent selves, melting together, melting away. I am, I say, but you don't hear me. On good days, you wish I were there, on better days, you crave me. On the best days, you feel me sitting amidst the brokenness of your body, your strange shiny pleasures and cardiac butterflies, lifting the veil of your darkness, setting your dust on fire. I am, I say, and there is no one besides me. And for a moment, you know it's you I'm calling, 
that I am the love into which you're falling, evaporating, one I am at a time. The part of you, the only part that isn't melting away. Um, and since that's a, a bit of a downer, um, I want to finish with, uh, I don't know, I think it's the closest the Shekhinah comes from this book to an anthem. Um, it's called Ready, and the um, epigraph from Isaiah is, Fear not, I am the one who helps you. And the Cosmo article, and this is really a good one, I strongly recommend it, is called Seven Empowering Life Lessons from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Ready. Are you ready to be strong? Are you ready to follow me beyond the fear that warns you to hold your tongue when cruelty and helplessness, degradation and evil stab you through the heart? Fear likes you this way, self-loathing and numb, believing you're no one I'd ever choose, a worm in a tunnel, dust in a gale, a nameless pool of blood I could never love. I summon them all to judgment, the fears that stalk you to the ends of the earth, the shame and disgrace that nail you to your place, everything that gets in the way of you responding when I say, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. I was here before fear and I'm there beyond it, opening fountains, trampling kings underfoot, calling you to me across generations, by paths you haven't walked, by ways you cannot imagine. I'm the mother who really sees, the father who understands you, every version, real and imagined, future and past, cypress and desert, queer fluid light, thresher of mountains, solitary pine. You have nothing to fear and nothing to prove. Are you ready to be strong? time to remake the world. Indeed. If that's okay, we could invite everybody to unmute yourself if you would like to have questions or comments to either of our readers. Woo! Woo! Michael. Don't want it to end. <laughs> um, I guess I'd like to say um, I've known Trace a very long time and feel very close to her, even though she's been away from Boston for a long time. And we were in a poetry group together and uh, Trace really brought a lot of the energy to that group. And when Trace moved to New York, the group fell apart and we realized <laughs> Trace was bringing us all together for writing poetry, reading poetry, going to readings and doing theory, which some people did not approve of. <laughs> and then went to New York and created other communities there. And I know Trace told me a long time ago uh, that Tenny, what a, an extraordinary teacher you were. And uh, as of course, Charles, who looks like his father, like her father, but um, <laughs> I'm just very struck by the sense of community here, and uh, and and those were wonderful poems, Joy, very moving and very interesting, and I've never heard anything like that, and I'd like to read some more of your work. So uh, thank you all. Thank you, Ruth, and it's so wonderful to see you. And I'm, I want to come up and hear you for your next reading uh, in Boston soon. That would be great. Hi, Marcos. Hi.
like you're in a very windy place. Yeah. I can see you're in a very windy place. Yes, I'm out in, outside. I'm actually right outside an electronic music party. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. How are you doing? Yeah, how are you doing? Yeah. How you been? It's so wonderful to see you. I've missed you. Yeah, I, I wanted to see you too. And yeah. I had this opportunity, so I, I took it. Uh, listen, I enjoy both readings very much. Actually, uh, you may not know this, but I, I lived in Israel for a while. Uh, five years before before I went to New York, just before I went to New York. And now I'm, I'm sending my warmest regard to you and, and all the people here from Uruguay. I'm living in Uruguay. I'm actually in a, in a beach resort this summer. Here. So it's, it's, it's hot. Today's not so hot, but it's a hot today. So for your MP, <laughs> I'm sending my warmest and hottest regards. To all of you and i was I, I wrote it there i was very moved by your point because i i i met you in the poetics group in new york city at, at the cuny graduate center do you remember and that was just before you started the transition and then i i remember i left new york by the time you started the process and and that poem brought me many many memories from that time and I also enjoy very much the poems by, by Joy because, as I told, as I told you, I I'm, I'm very close to the Jewish experience. And actually, Shehina is uh, in, in the Kabbalistic tradition is uh, a, fem, a a female expression of of God. Uh, it's the, the presence of God is, is felt as a female in, in Kabbalistic tradition, not in all Jewish trends, but. Uh, some time ago, uh, I read a, an, 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 editor, an, an editorial writing by uh, Mark Samet, a rabbi who posed this question. It's, it's called Transgender. And he made a reading of the, of the name of God based on the Hebrew pronouns, I, the, who, who are the male and female third person singular pronouns that actually he maintained that are the components of the name of God. So uh, I was moved by this idea that uh, there's a trans issue in, in, the, in the whole theological Jewish tradition. Well, I wanted to comment about that because uh, I think it, it goes very, it's very, very close to what uh, Joy was reading. And I enjoy both readings very much. I wanted to, to say you my regards. Bye. Joy, did you have anything to say about that, to add to that? Oh, um, my answer to is God transgender is no. Um, I, <laughs> I think that, you know, a being that doesn't have a body doesn't really have much use for gender. But the part of it that makes it, you know, in the Hebrew Bible, in Hebrew, you can see the misfit between God and human language and human conceptual categories. God actually is not consistently gendered. God's often described in non-human terms as a rock, animal, you know, I mean, like, uh, that's what the Shekhinah does also. She names herself in many different ways. And part of the message of that is, actually, I got that bit of trans poetics from Whitman when he names himself in many different ways. What he's really trying to do is, is point toward a concept of self that doesn't fit into any of those delimiting categories that human beings use to construct identities. Um, I also wanted to say about Violet's speech, um, you know, I was saying trans poetics are, I've always thought of them as techniques for trying to represent ways of being that don't fit into human conventions and thus don't fit into human language. But I think in Trace's poem, where you hear these different discourses of flowers, of art, of office work, of law, they're all um, mushed together. Um, I don't have a more artful term right now, but they're mushed together in a way that I, for me, forces me to try to imagine the kind of being to whom all of these languages 
would simultaneously apply. It doesn't feel like there is a kind of being that is being denoted by them or by the collision of them, but I feel like Trace is really capturing the, the fact that language, we rely on language so much to try to understand who we are and who other people are, that it's impossible for me not to hear her poem and try to conceive of this kind of impossible kind of being. Um, uh, so thank you for that, Trace. Thank you, Joy. That's really beautiful. Um, and I, I really love the, the Shekhinah poems that you're, uh, the new Shekhinah poems that you've written. Um, it's, it's just, it's taking um, all of the things that were in those poems ready to know. And I think that, that was some of the stuff that became Transit of Venus. Am I right? Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think those are some of your great, and whenever I teach classes in trans poetry, that's, those are always the poems everybody immediately goes to. They're like everybody's favorite because there's something about the way the discourse is combined or, or mushed together, as you're saying. Um, the discourse of the, the cosmopolitan discourse and the, um, the um, in this case, you're using biblical language now. And um, so I'm also struck by sort of how more lyrical these are than the initial, the initial poems are, there's sort of a lot of moments of bathos or, you know, funny moments that dip down. And you've managed to kind of weave everything into this seamless lyrical thing in this newer piece. It's more intense. And it's also more, um, you have these wonderful moments like melting away at the end of that poem, which it's like sad and and deep and intense, but it's also funny because it, it alludes to, if you know, it alludes to the weight loss article. <laughs> um, how do you feel that this, that series is different from the earlier uh, Transit of Venus poems or did it grow naturally out of that? I think there was a, you had a name for that, didn't, didn't you? The, the you, the something or other you? Oh, I, I have invented so many critical figure terms. Of, it was a figure of address. On. Um, to a you, and it was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I've been, that was a, those poems were a prophetic you. They were definitely precursors for me. You know, the Shekhinah. Prophetic you, yeah. Right. In the Shekhinah speaks poems, I'm working for the Shekhinah. You know, like, that is not me. But it is, you know, the Shekhinah, and I told her, you should have gotten a better poet because, you know, I'm not up to this. Um, but the Shekhinah is using the stuff that I've learned to do over this. So discourse fusion is one of those things. That's a term that I created. And you can see it in uh, Emily Dickinson's work. A lot of times she's so compressed that she'll use a single word to signal one discourse and then an, another single word to, you know, when she says zero at the bone, for example, it's like, what did you just do? Like, and uh, Chris Stan Miller points out that Essentially, the discourses have a metaphoric relation to one another, but it's not grounded. We don't know which is the, you know, which is the figure for which. So is zero, you know, zero mathematical language for a physical state? Is the physical state a figure for the abstract, right? So, so Dickinson's way ahead of me, but you know, when the Shekhinah was um, commandeering my work for this. This is stuff that I've been practicing for a long time and in the Transit of Venus poems. Um, the thing about the Transit of Venus poems is there's a, uh, somebody talking to, the, to a you the way there is in the Shekhinah poems, but there's no I. I didn't have an I. Um, the best I could get at that point was this voice from the future is the way I experienced it, kind of trying to talk to the self that was trying to emerge in the present and hooks me along. The Shekhinah is, is an I, right? And, and is a you, but she's an I who is also the you who she's addressing. And she's completely out of time. She's outside of time. So she, part of her trouble in talking to human beings is that she exists in what we think of as the past, present and the future all at once. So for her, those long list sentences those are ways of trying to use syntax to overcome sequentiality. Like human beings have sequentiality. 
but by the time you get to the end of the sentence, you're supposed to realize that she's there at every moment in your life saying these things to you. Anyway, like I say, I was a poor approximation of it, but you're right, transit of Venus was practice. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Um, I, it looks like Tammy has a question. I don't, I wanted to acknowledge that. Yeah, thank you. I hope I hope it, it's a comprehensible question, but I was thinking um, there's all the stuff in romantic poetry, the, the vocative, you know, so there's a Paul Fry book, The Poet's Calling in the English Ode. So so the ability to sort of evoke, you know, the God or the West Wind. Or, so so I guess what struck me, maybe in Joy, another way of saying some of what what you were saying about your own work is it feels like a reverse vocative in a way that there's something you know something's calling to the poet and calling the poet into being you know and 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 that feels in general like um a trustworthy invitation and and then and then in trace's work there's a sense that um whatever those discourses are there, there's a kind of edgier or um more skeptical relation to them it feels like so I just I don't know if that you know if if that's something that either one of you could could respond to or would want to. Trace, I think I've used up my pontification budget. You're you're so modest. Um, uh, well, uh, one thing I wanted to say to start with is that um, it's been really it's really an honor to read with Joy because um, she's one of my favorite poets, obviously. And, I was just, I'm actually, uh, I was writing an article in which Joy's work figures prominently um, for a Routledge book before I joined this Zoom. So <laughs> that's something that happened. But um, to address Tenny's wonderful question, um, so I think those discourses came about because um, at the time there was a lot of, um, this would have been around 2009, 2008, and it was the era of conceptual poetry. Um, I would say 2009, 2010. And um, so I was thinking there was a lot of discussion about borrowed discourses and, and what um, growing, I think growing out of very much kind, the kind of thing that, Tenny, that you identified about Bernstein's controlling interests, where you have these um, bits of discourse um, that are sort of made ironic and um, attention is drawn to them. Um, you know, uh, Fran and Don, it, it's great to see you. You know, next time our little Italian restaurant, you know, you have these ironic um, things. And um, they're, you, they're, the reader is encouraged to have a critical uh, relationship to them. Um, but in conceptual poetry, um, you ended up with something that was a little more troubling where the appropriation was, um, was sometimes problematic. Um, and it was also sort of like farming out one's labor to um, uh, to something else. We, we don't, who could say what it, what it is, but the idea that you just take big chunks of other, st other stuff and, and that's your poem. Um, uh, it becomes, and uh, it sort of belies or elides the conversation about, well, what are you, specifically using and why um, and what is the political meaning of that what is the personal meaning of that um, I think sort of sort of got left out of that conversation so what I was writing was I was reading Judith Butler's excitable speech and I was reading um, uh, giving an account of oneself uh, and I was uh, I think that poem just kind of it sort of happened spontaneously as a kind of um, uh, it was thinking uh, allegorically of several situations at once uh, and thinking about like social and gender and uh, poetic situations and thinking about um, how to sort of rest, rest, how to wrestle a self from th this situation that would have any sense of integrity or, um, and, so the discourses, one of the discourses was I was, um, I had a very aggressive landlord and if I was at all late with my rent, he would send me these crazy notices that said, take notice, you know, you're being evicted from your apartment. Um, <clears throat> and it's not true according to New York 
rent rental law, you know, uh, it, it wasn't like that at all. But this very aggressive, he had this very aggressive lawyer who would go after me every month and, you know, it was, it or every other month and it, it was awful. And then um, some of the other discourses, I was working for a group of architects. So I had sort of architects language on the brain and I was, um, <clears throat> the architects called me the only woman in the office. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which has its whole whole set of implications. Um, uh, and um, this was pre-transition, of course. And um, I was also um, trying to think of where the other stuff comes from. The other stuff comes from theory and from, um, I don't know, I guess a little narrative about the violets and the wasps, which are two things. The wasps are both Bzz, bzz, and uh, and the other kind of wasp, um, which is self implicating, of course. And then um, I feel very strongly that Rothko's late paintings are 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 really kind of annoying, <laughs> in in ways that remind me of what what's not as successful about conceptual poetry. Um, and so I think that all kind of factors in. So so am I Rothko? Yet yeah, yes, but at the same time, um, Rothko represents. Um, something potentially sort of menacing that I don't identify with at all. So a lot of that poem is about uh, also like the bad object and the good object colliding in various ways. And I, that's where some of the energy for me comes comes out of it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and what's, what's moving to me about it and beautiful is that you can kind of go through all that junk in the service of a project that has some relation to Joy's project, you know, the kind of coming through all that and coming into being in a, in a really beautiful way. Yeah. yeah, and I think I learned how to do that from from reading, you know, Erased Art and from reading Home on the Range too. some of that, I think. And I love the concept of re reverse vocative. So thank you for that, um, that way of thinking about it. Um, Julie, I, I just wanted to ask a little bit um, about Isaiah and specifically about um, thinking about parallels and context perhaps and thus Shahina Speaks becomes a book of in their way socio-politically laden poems. Can you speak to that a little bit? Um, actually, Maggie, would you mind saying a little bit more about what you're wondering about? Because well, if Isaiah the... begins with a con with a warning, right, with a condemnation, is that where some element, whether it be um, the the speaker? The, the speaker as mediary or the speaker as self and will, um, don't these poems in some way echo or make some condemnations about our moment? Ah, uh, yes. Um, I wanna say for those of you who are not biblical wonks, the book of Isaiah really has two quite different parts. It's the work of two different prophets, uh, one of whom is a great prophet and the other of whom is not. I mean, is a great poet. Both of them are great prophets in the sense in the roles that they play, uh, articulating the divine human relationship. And they're very political, both of them. There are many references about uh, politics and in fact the nature of Hebrew poetry a lot of it is God um, uh, insisting on being visible in terms of human history and human political arrangements insisting that you can't separate the divine from the social um, so in that sense absolutely yes but I was um, reaching for second Isaiah from chapter 40 on it's just some of the greatest poetry that's ever been written as well as these incredible prophecies. And a lot of Second Isaiah, not all of it by any means, but a lot of it are monologues of God. So I was drawn to this first because when I realized I had to do this project, I thought, well, I don't know how a divine being 
speaks. How does Shekhina speak? And I thought, well, any way she wants to, but that's not very helpful. You know, I mean, it's true. Theologically, I stand by that, but poetically that was not getting me anywhere. So I'm like, I need some certified God language. Why not go to certified God language that's also great poetry? So that got me to second Isaiah. Um, and I started sampling one of those monologues and I thought this is sure fire because this is great stuff. Um, but instead it just sounded like somebody had put um, Isaiah into a Cuisinart. I mean, it was just awful. There was nothing that was good about it. And oh, well, that was a failure. And I thought, wait a second, the Shekhina isn't just the divine voice that you hear in Isaiah. In second Isaiah, the divine voice is not gendered at all, really is not gendered. You know, in one line, God's were saying, I cry out like a woman in childbirth. And the next line, like a man of war. It's like, you know, as all over the place. Um, Whitman gets that, you know, multiplicity of self-definition directly from second Isaiah. Um, but the Shekhinah is gendered female and that brought me back to, you know, cosmopolitan to, to try that. So in the poems, mostly the political stuff wasn't coming from the divine monologues in Isaiah because I took uh, I took them too much out of context um, for that to be the case. But the, a lot of the Cosmo poems are quite political in ways that I didn't intend. And sometimes I was like forced into using Cosmo articles by the Shekhinah that were really upsetting. Like there's this long article about rape culture among the Amish, you know, whole families where like all of the men in the family are raping all of the female children and you know, and the whole community is covering. I'm like, really, I, I need to, to do this, you know? And so, but the, the stuff about women's lives is political. I think probably in every era, women's lives are inherently political in a certain kind of way that the, that the um, decontextualized, very distant politics of the book of Isaiah wouldn't have had that effect. However, once it's at one of the things about different discourses, when you fuse them together, they activate one another and they bring out different, like zero at the bone, they, they bring out different aspects of one another. And so I think what Maggie is pointing out, I really appreciate it, is that the political aspect of Isaiah that I denuded from the way that I was using the text is restored to some extent by the contact with the language from Cosmo. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's almost as if one, one discourse reveals something and the other discourse that wasn't there before. And you, you know, using that word revelation, you know, in, 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 a, in multiple ways too. Yeah. Yeah. I wish we could be here all night and hear you read all, you know, it's really, really wonderful. Uh, Trace, I've known before. Joy, it's lovely to meet you and, and to hear your work. Um, it's about, it's going to be quarter to seven. Does anybody have anything more that they wanted to add or should we say good night? Or... Only maybe wanted to add that um, there's so much pouring out in these readings and so much that comes through change and struggle and yet the the tone of it being so calm tonight is astounding to me and 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 wonderful thank you yes. both uh, trace and joy thank you all thank you all for coming and we hope to see you soon i don't know when we'll do our next zoom reading but you know if they're like this, we should do them all the time. So, okay. Thank Be well, everybody. Time. Be safe. Take care of yourselves. See you soon. Yeah, so wonderful. Thank you, Trace. Thanks, Tori. Charles? Good night. Hmm? Charles, how are you doing? You sound, you said you hadn't been well, but you're getting better now. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay.
Thank you. Remember, okay, remember we're supposed to confirm that pickup? Yes. Okay, ETA. Okay. Estimated time of arrival. All right, I will do that with you. Oh, when? <laughs> no, but you said it was okay to ask you now? Oh, okay. Um, I'll probably... Around one? Yeah, or, I mean... I'll probably pick you up around one. Oh, okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. So many crossed lines and emails and texts and nobody seems to know what's going on. Thank you. I appreciate you. that. Bye -bye. Just so happy about tonight. Yes. Um, I always feel like I'm coming home. I'm home. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Goodbye, everyone. My family. Charles. You don't know me. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Thank Good night. you so much, everyone. It was a real Thank pleasure. You. All right.